Hi everybody, my name is Daniel and I'm from Easy Aerospace and uh, we're working towards making the access to space low cost. So this is what we usually see from space, uh, in that case from the International Space Station. And in order to understand how space works, um, let's give you a quick introduction of how it all started with the space industry. In fact, it all, it's all based on the work of this guy, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, Russian man, who developed the very basic rocket equation, which in fact just tells you how big and fat your rocket is going to get if you want to place a payload of X kilograms into Earth orbit. So there was a lot of work done in, the, in Germany actually, then in the US and in Russia. And there was this American guy from the toilet who invented the first liquid fuel rocket, which is very high performing. And since space, since, uh, since rocket technology is uh, based on the military uh, work previously done, um, there's, a, there's a very tight connection also to the, to the defense uh, space sector. So the German A4 or B2 uh, was the first rocket to reach space, which is defined at 100 kilometers in altitude. And after the Second World War, there was a split in maybe uh, most engineers between the United States and the Soviet Union. So both of them were working towards rocket technology. And then it was the Russians that first placed the, the first human in space, which was Yuri Gagarin, just four years after placing the first man-made satellites into Earth orbit. We all know the Americans were the first ones to, uh, to achieve a successful moon landing uh, with the Saturn V rocket, which was mainly built also by German engineers who went to the United States after the Second World War. So in the, in the 60s, late 60s, um, there was a moon landing, and then there was nothing. And from a technology point of view, uh, not that much did happen. I mean, yes, there was the space shuttle. Although space shuttle was the first reusable launch vehicle, at least partially reusable, it was designed for a 10 million uh, launch costs uh, for design. In the end, it ended at 1.5 billion per launch uh, there was a total of about 120 launches for a space shuttle, so that entire program was about $150 billion. So that was kind of old space. Um, then we have the International Space Station, which is currently traveling at 36,000 kilometers per hour, uh, like 30,000, um, at 400 kilometers in, in altitude around the Earth, and which is very important for humanity uh, because there's a lot of uh, academic work being done and um, in fact that still is very cost intense until there was some internet billionaire guy in the early 2000s, uh, Elon, who, who said okay why don't we, why don't we can uh, integrate vertically our entire business and all of the manufacturing and thereby lower the costs. So let's take a look at three rockets. We have on the first hand side, on the left hand side, we have Falcon 9, which is currently dominating the market uh, entirely, which is about 90 million per launch and can place about 20, 22 tons into lower Earth orbits. Then there's Falcon Heavy, which can place 100, uh, uh, about 63 tons into Earth orbits for about 150 million per launch. And then the third vehicle is the Delta IV Heavy which was predominantly um, taking all of, the, all of the payloads into Earth orbits before there was SpaceX. And there's the price tag, it's 350 million for more or less the same that a Falcon 9 can do. However, Delta IV Heavy had a monopoly in government launches. And this is actually what the old space economy is, it's a lot of connections, um, a lot of politics involved of course, but now technology advances and gets available to everybody. So there's, for example, a standardized satellite system called CubeSats, which is in the smallest unit, just 10 times 10 times 10 centimeters small, but it's a fully functional CubeSat. So you can do, for example, Earth imaging just by this very little small cube. And then, of course, there's even student groups developing, uh, developing rockets, developing satellites, so here we want to show you a quick 
video of what we did at Technical University of Munich at the end of last year. So we went to Lambertshausen, which is one of the largest uh, rocket engine testing sites in Germany and also uh, within Europe. And there we tested the rocket engine we developed at the student group VAR. Some of you may know the student group VAR as well from the uh, from the Hackerloop competition, which they just won in third time in a row uh, two days ago. And the student group also developed their own satellite. So we're in fact covering different topics of the space industry. And of course, the, uh, the rocket engine is one of the most critical parts of any rocket. advances, even rocket science falls into the hands of students at a shoestring budget. So, where are we now? Where do we want to go? Let's say, for example, this CubeSat system with, uh, with very small satellites, you can do a lot of different business models. For example, you can monitor your, how your crops are evolving. If you're a farmer, for example, you can do uh, infrared scanning of your farms. Um, and do automatic, uh, automatic analysis of, of how your crop is evolving. On the other hand, you, uh, hand, you can also do 3D mapping, for example, or you can uh, do weather forecasting. So there's, uh, there's very many possibilities that you can use space as a platform. Another example, for example, is what, uh, what uh, SpaceX is doing, what Facebook is doing, uh, what OneWeb is doing is providing internet to the entire humanity, to the entire globe. And some of these concepts are based on satellites. So by placing hundreds of thousands of satellites into low Earth orbits, or even medium Earth orbits, uh, you, can, you can achieve global coverage uh, and provide internet for low cost. And here again, a big point is the access to space. And since technology advances, and a satellite is nothing less than uh, just electronics, more or less, um, and electronics advances, this spacecraft gets smaller. So this is a chart uh, showing the average spacecraft mass or satellite mass over the past years, where we can see a massive decline. On the other hand, since technology is available everywhere nowadays, the number of satellites is increasing heavily. So we're seeing, we're seeing a high growth rate in uh, satellite deployments. And that's why, on the other hand, mini launchers are being developed worldwide. So you don't need for your 100, 150 kilograms small satellites, you don't need rockets anymore that can carry up to 20, 30, 40 tons into Earth orbits. But it's just 100 kilograms or 200 trillion grams. And you get also the flexibility of launching very fast and into your specified orbits. Then there's production technology. So again, as technology advances, you can leverage, for example, additive manufacturing. This is a picture of an uh, additive manufactured rocket engine we did at ISA Aerospace. Uh, and there you can drastically lower the costs and also the manufacturing time. For example, for a conventionally manufactured rocket engine, you calculate about 9 to 12 months just in production time. With additive manufacturing, this time gets down to about two weeks. Of course, there's the, the big question, can you somehow leverage reusability? And yes, SpaceX has demonstrated that it's possible. Until about 15 years ago, everyone would have said SpaceX is completely crazy because they're trying to reuse rockets, and rockets are not reusable. But in fact, they now are. And uh, this, again, is, is lowering the cost for SpaceX uh, access drastically. And what's most important for the entire industry and the entire market is competition. Because if you just have one uh, launcher described, for example, such as Delta IV Heavy was, uh, you can just go up in prices as much as you want because you're the only provider. Um, and then we just uh, um, gain from the, from the market and, and from your monopoly. So if you, pl if you place a lot of, lot of satellites into, into Earth orbits, um, where do we eventually want to go? Um, I mean, it's, uh, just placing cars into Earth orbit for the sake of placing cars into Earth orbits is uh, not that great of a story. 
Um, but we can do a lot of different things. For example, we can take the moon as a stepping stone for further human exploration. And the moon is quite good because you can reach the moon in about two to three days uh, compared to reaching Mars, which takes you about nine months with your rocket. And then, of course, there's space mining. Uh, you, can, you can leverage the, the materials available uh, that are on moon, for example. Uh, you could use maybe uh, helium-3, for example, um, carry it back to the Earth and, uh, and operate your energy clean uh, fusion reactors. So there's many different possibilities. On the other hand, there's raw, uh, rare materials such as palladium, platinum, that's available in space and on asteroids, but only in uh, very limited amounts uh, available on Earth. And then, of course, there's the idea of uh, making human, uh, human life multiplanetary and going to, to uh, build spaces on the Moon and Mars and uh, let's, let's say have a backup plan for, for uh, bad events that could happen on Earth, so, so to say to, to keep the Earth from extinction or humanity from extinction. Of course, some of you guys know of course this picture. Um, Mars, for example, is, uh, could be habitable uh, by humans, um, but of course there's some, some work that needs to be done. And we're one of the companies, and we're happy also to have a, a very active ecosystem around the space business as well in Munich, um, to, uh, to the entire space industry, and in, in gas to lower the cost for space access. Thank you very much. Any questions? Someone here has questions? Please raise your hand. Can you explain a bit more about how to make Mars habitable? Mars? Um, Mars has uh, more or less no atmosphere, so you need to develop uh, lots of technology that you can carry around with you, so to say, um, life enhancement systems, and uh, the challenge here is to make it very user-friendly. So it's, it's not that great if you should carry your own uh, uh, spacesuit, but it weighs about uh, 150 kilograms, although you weigh less on Mars because Mars is smaller than Earth. Um, but in the end, there has to be a lot, uh, lot of work to be done in uh, life sciences. So also um, to make uh, life support systems very small, but on the other hand reliable. Because what would you do if there's uh, a system your life depends on, and that one needs to be... Um, uh, you need to have two of the systems, so just to be fault tolerant, for example. And then all of this, this stuff uh, is uh, increasing complexity. and. Uh, just going to Mars for the sake of going to Mars is one way, but on the other hand, uh, you should, or humanity should think about on what do we want to achieve when going to Mars, and therefore also um, some some new uh, constraints are being set. Uh, so I, I have two questions. So I apologize. Uh, first question is um, from a legal standpoint. If um, a private enterprise wants to land on the moon or on, Mar on Mars, are there any laws in place or any kind of agreements in the world that are in place that prevent that from happening or make that difficult? Uh, that's my first question. And the second, second question. Ask the first question. Um, you can land everywhere. I mean, space is open for everyone. You can't claim land on the moon, but in fact, you can use the resources, for example. If you find an asteroid and you want to use the materials, you can do so under specific regulations. For example, uh, countries like Luxembourg are also pushing the legal boundaries of that. And um, you can, for example, then use the materials of asteroids, but you can't claim that the entire asteroid is yours or is your land. You can't do that. Um, and my next question is, uh, in terms of disruptive technologies, especially from the software industry, what would you say would be the top two or three disruptive technologies that you feel need to happen for space to be truly accessible, especially to the private industry? 
In terms of speaking disruptive, um, I mean, yes, this is a disruptive track, and it's more or less on the business model side. Many people ask me, what did SpaceX invent so that they're very cheap and, uh, and very technology-driven? In fact, I always say they counted on the technology and used the technology from the 60s and not the one from the 80s. Because in space, you just need to be really, really reliable. Of course, um, the technology that needs more to advance, of course, is um, electronics and, and software to do real-time guidance, for example. So up until 20, 30 years ago, you had only predefined uh, trajectories you could fly with your rocket. But now you can also do uh, real-time simulated uh, trajectories. So at each guided cycle, let's say for example a second, you calculate the end of your trajectory and whether you reach orbit or not. Thereby you have to adjust your steering, uh, your gimbaling of your rocket engine, for example. So just the enhancement of uh, computation power is a real, real big effort and, and advantage to, to launch vehicles, for example. How do you regulate the room in space? I mean, if you send up now all these small little satellites, uh, at some point it's just too much, so how do you regulate them? There are many regulations in place, so that mainly satellites that are out of service um, will make their space they're using free again, and this is done by just placing, for example, CubeSats into orbits that naturally decay. So about at uh, a maximum of 25 years, your, or, uh, your satellite needs to come down without even a de-orbit burn. On the other hand, of course, you can regulate that by saying um, after about 10 years, your satellite needs to de-orbit and uh, go into the atmosphere and just burn up. Um, there are regulations on the way, and some are already in place. Another possibility that again would be to set up so-called um, catcher satellites that just uh, make an interception of another satellite and it's de-orbit uh, satellites, for example, that are already out of service. Uh, talking about uh, inside aerospace, um, do you provide technology used for launches or do you launch yourself? Both. I mean, on the other hand, we provide uh, technology used for launch vehicles. For example, we're very much focused on the rocket engine part. In the long term, of course, um, we, we plan to do our, our own uh, launches just to have the end-to-end -end service to the customer. Any other questions? So if we don't have any other questions, please, another big applause for Daniel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We have one more. Are you involved in developing aerospace engine? Uh, we do not develop aerospace, just from a technological point of view. Um, some things are not there yet. So just from a material point of view, for example, um, you don't have the materials yet to achieve the cooling necessary. So after a specified burn time, your engines are just going to melt away. Um, so we're, again, as I said before, um, space needs to be very reliable. And if you want to use, for example, airspike nozzles, um, you have to do a lot, a lot of research just to get the engine system itself very reliable. All right. Thank you very much. So, thank, thank you very much, Daniel.